Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. I'm your host, Thomas. Thanks so much for tuning in. Tonight, we'll once again resume our sleepy retelling of the classic tale of Cinderella. This is the third and final installment of the series. I'll quickly recap what we've heard so far in just a moment, but if you haven't listened to the first two episodes yet, feel free to pause here and go back to play those now. You can come back to part three whenever you're ready. Also, for our premium subscribers, we'll be releasing the full story in a long-length stitched episode tomorrow night. In the second episode, Cinderella heads off to the ball in the pumpkin carriage, wearing the gold dress, slippers, and jewels given to her by her fairy godmother. Though she doesn't realize it, Cinderella is the most beautiful guest at the party, and she instantly catches the prince's eye. She spends the whole evening dancing with him. They are so caught up in dancing, they don't have a chance to tell each other their names, sparing Cinderella any possible trouble. Before midnight, she slips out of the room and returns home before the enchantment is broken. The following day, her stepmother and stepsisters are gossiping about the mysterious and beautiful stranger who captivated the prince all evening long. Cinderella realizes they are talking about her. Not long after, the prince holds a second ball. Once again, Cinderella is able to attend with the help of her fairy godmother. She and the prince spend another magical evening together, dancing until nearly midnight. Though she's had a wonderful evening at both parties, Cinderella understands she likely won't have the chance to see the prince again. Feeling a little forlorn, she lays down for a nap. Shortly, we'll pick up the tale with Cinderella waking up after a long and restful sleep. But first, let's make sure we're ready for a restful sleep of our own. So get comfortable in bed, making any adjustments you need. And when you're ready, gently close your eyes. Know that you are in the right place to enjoy a peaceful rest. Just by hitting play on this episode and settling into bed, you've already kick-started your night of rest and recovery. Though you're likely still conscious of my words for now, the energy flowing within your body and mind will gradually start to slow down and dissipate. and you can allow this to happen without resistance. If you're anything like me, you might find that something pops up in your thoughts that tries to drag you back into a more heightened state of awareness. That's quite natural, and while it's frustrating, It's best not to engage too much and fight it, but to simply let it be. 
try not to allow yourself to be pulled into battles with your worries and concerns. Instead, just remind yourself that now is not the time to deal with them, and bring your focus back to my voice. Enjoy a nice deep breath with me now, breathing in for one, two, three, four, five, and back out for five, four, three, two, one. Perfect. Now, we're ready to return to our fairy tale for the final part of Cinderella. So continue to enjoy your peaceful rest as we rejoin Cinderella, who's waking up to a new day. This is where our story begins. She awoke to a brighter day, feeling foggy. Lying there, staring up at the ceiling, Cinderella realized that it was her birthday. She was turning 18, and she was quite sure that nobody would even remember. She rolled over and looked at Henry happily wagging his tail by the door. It's my birthday, Henry, she said. The dog whined quietly and stepped from foot to foot. Cinderella smiled at him indulgently. You'll have to be my present today, she said as she rose and straightened herself up. While standing at her mirror, she noticed there was a bit of a commotion in the hallway. Imogen was calling down the corridor to Agnes, and they were discussing something in high-pitched voices. Cautiously opening her door, Cinderella stuck her head out to see what was going on. Her stepsisters were standing with Lydia between them, huddled over a piece of paper. Sensing her presence, all three of them stopped talking and glared at her directly. Then Lydia said, Cinderella, it's about time you made an appearance, you lazy girl. Be hasty with your morning chores, for your skills will be needed in the drawing room. There is to be a third ball in just three days, and there won't be time to order new gowns. You'll have to dress up the ones Agnes and Imogen already have. With that, the three women turned away and went rushing down the hall to chatter about plans and to pen a note begging another neighbor for the loan of their carriage. Cinderella stood frozen in the long hallway, filled with conflicting emotions. On one hand, another chance to see Prince Edward, 
was the best birthday gift she could have asked for. One worthy of her fairy godmother. However, she also knew that she was perilously close to falling head over heels in love with a man who could never know her name. A man who surely wouldn't want to marry her if he knew the truth. Gazing down at her house dress and suddenly conscious of her messy hair, she imagined him arriving at their front door to meet her family. Then the image dissolved in her mind because it was too improbable to conjure any further. Shaking her head, she pushed the ridiculous notion to the back of her thoughts and went downstairs to begin her labors in the kitchen. This was going to be a trying day, she thought. And of course, she was not wrong. As skillful as she was with a needle, she was not a magician. It would have taken the arts of her fairy godmother to create the impression that Agnes and Imogen had new dresses. She spent the afternoon with Lydia barking orders as she tied one piece of lace after another and pinned this or that ribbon differently. In the end, she was tasked with a series of alterations that would keep her quite busy until the ball. On the day of the ball, the entire household awoke to a heavy snowfall, and oh how it was coming down. Worried that the roads would become impassable, Lydia bustled her daughters and their finery into the borrowed carriage once again, and set off for the home of an acquaintance in town. From there, it would be a much easier journey to reach the palace that night. Accordingly, Cinderella convinced Cook to leave early, so she might get home safely to her family. This left the girl alone, with just Henry for company. It was a relief to have her stepsisters out of the house, but the grey hours of the afternoon seemed to last forever. She felt quite alone on the estate, as the skies only grew darker. While she waited, curled up in the cocoon of her window seat, she got her thoughts in order. Yes, she decided, she would go to the ball, providing her fairy godmother appeared for her one final time. And yes, she continued, she would dance with Edward again. Blushing to herself, she was filled with joy to know in her heart that he would ask for her company again. And when the night was over, his family would leave the county. There would be no more reason for her to moon about. She would go on with her life and be grateful 
that she had met him, and that she had been this happy for a little while. The only remaining problem was how to somehow conceal her identity a third time. Deep in her heart, Cinderella knew she was fooling herself with all this well-intentioned resolve to move on. She knew that to see the prince again was to risk her heart but she could not stay away. Pushing down any thoughts of the like, she stepped outside at dusk. The world was hushed, weighted with the silence that only a heavy snowfall can bring. The flakes came down thickly all around her, coating her hair and her shoulders within moments. She watched the ground, mesmerized, as she made fresh tracks in the purest white snow. Behind her, Henry silently created a miniature trail of paw prints to parallel her own path. She opened the gate with some difficulty, breaking through the small drifts that had accumulated around it. Then, feeling confident in the existence of the magic, she stood still and made no sound. She didn't even take a breath. She simply waited, closing her eyes and earnestly wishing for the enchantment to last one more night. It wasn't a sound or a light that made her open her eyes. Rather, she felt as if a million tiny crystals washed over her, and she knew that it was happening again. Opening her eyes, she gasped, for the gown that hung before her in the hazel tree was unlike any she had ever seen. If a person could collect the stars in the sky and weave them into a divine fabric, that's what her fairy godmother had done to conjure this dress. It wasn't silver. It was as if it was made of diamonds and light. The skirts were like gauze floating and shimmering with every small movement of the breeze. Two impossibly dainty, brilliant slippers stood on the ground beneath. They looked as if they were made of glass, an effect no mortal shoemaker could have created. And on the branch next to the gown, instead of a necklace, a modest little diamond tiara glittered. Like the topaz and sapphire jewelry, Cinderella recognized it as a piece her mother had once worn on very special occasions. Her mother would be with her tonight. Overcome with gratitude, Cinderella turned to the ethereal benefactress once again, 
but her smile soon fell. How would she get to the ball? The weather had made the road nearly impassable. Is it too late? she asked the beautiful apparition. At this, her godmother gave a laugh so musical it almost sounded like chimes, and she shook her head. Waving her hand in the general direction of the pumpkin, for it was now buried under the snow, she made a flourish. In seconds, a handsome sleigh had appeared in the drive. Then, as a furry white rabbit hopped across the garden, her godmother waved the other hand. Instantly, it had disappeared, and a beautiful white horse stood hitched to the sleigh instead. And of course, Henry followed moments after in his transformation. This time, he'd be driving her to the ball in high style, on metal runners that flew across the ice and snow. Hardly able to contain herself, Cinderella turned in a circle, knowing that she would soon be dressed in the delicate, starry gown. And she was. But even as she sensed the skirts settling around her, she was also aware of a luxurious velvet cloak that covered her. It protected her perfectly styled curls with a capacious hood and sheltered her from the ice and snow. The little tiara sparkled elegantly in her hair. Henry helped her into the cushioned back seat of the silver and red sleigh and then took up his position in the front. Cinderella turned to her godmother with happy gratitude. She was not surprised to receive the familiar reminder about being home by midnight. This will be a beautiful evening, her godmother said. But then, more sternly, she urged, Do not test the limits of the magic. The midnight hour is still the moment of its expiration. If you stay too long, you'll find yourself in a mess. Be sensible, and all will be well. Eager to be off, Cinderella issued a solemn promise to be responsible. Their swift progress towards the third and final royal ball was dreamlike. The weather was unrelenting, dropping a heavy curtain of white all around the speeding sleigh. However, in contrast to the rumbling and bouncing of the carriage, the sleigh made Cinderella feel like she was flying. Wrapped inside her protective coat, safe from the elements, she watched the ghostly landscape glide by. It was otherworldly. 
despite how quick the journey was. Her arrival could not come soon enough. She was acutely aware that this would be the last time, that these would be her last dances and smiles with Edward. She was simultaneously eager to begin the evening and loathsome for the inevitable end of it to approach. When her sleigh pulled up to the front steps, the footman at the door seemed impressed, pulling themselves up a little taller. The man who helped her step down forgot his usual deferential pose and looked up at her with open admiration. Even hidden under her cloak as she was, her arrival made a stir. As she gingerly made her way up the steps to the front door, another servant bowed low, motioning her inside. This time, coats and capes were being taken from the guests and whisked away to a nearby room. The visitors were then introduced once the ladies had been given an opportunity to rearrange their garments and their hair. Cinderella took careful note of the location of the cloakroom. Then she stepped into the shadows near the ballroom entrance and swept in behind another family who had just been announced. Breathing a sigh of relief, she stood on the side and looked around to get her bearings. But it was impossible for her to remain unnoticed. An audible gasp seemed to travel around the room as the other guests took in her astounding beauty. Amid all the other fine silks, heavy velvets, and demure ribbons and laces, her gown was truly a sight to behold, and she glowed from within. Cinderella turned uncertainly and nodded politely to the people staring at her on either side. Thankfully, she was rescued by Edward, who appeared starstruck in front of her. Bowing low, he invited her to dance. If previous waltzes had been invigorating, or delightful, or enchanting, this one was like a spell. At first, they swayed through the steps with their eyes locked. Not a word passed between them. It was like a magnet drew them together. Their embrace was decorous, but also inseparable. When the music changed, there was no question of changing partners. The prince would have no other. With curiosity, he asked her why she kept leaving unexpectedly, without offering an explanation. Cinderella had anticipated this question, 
and she knew that evasiveness was her only option. Falling back on the privilege of a lady to her privacy, she apologized for the inconvenience and said that she had been called away at the last moment. Edward knew he must be satisfied with this answer, and they returned to dancing in silence. But not before he impulsively said, I do believe you are the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Cinderella blushed deeply at this, unable to hide her pleasure at his words. Looking back steadfastly at his kind eyes and his handsome smile, she responded that he looked very fine himself, and the two danced on, oblivious to the rest of the company. After a time, Edward asked her when she was going to tell him her name. She responded that, since he was not good at guessing, she would tell him what she called her little dog, and that he would get her name if he asked her after midnight. Playing along with her game, he said, Well then, let's have it. What is your dog's name? It's Henry, she said decisively. Well, he responded with a skeptical look. I must say, I think Jasper would be better. Then both of them laughed, and he whirled her faster around the room. Soon, he spoke again. You have to tell me something about yourself. Do you play the piano? At this, Cinderella shook her head. I'm afraid any man who wishes to hear the piano in my company must play it himself, she responded with gravity. This did not seem to bother the prince at all. He asked her another question. Is there any type of book you like to read? At this, Cinderella brightened. Yes, I love to read. My father has, or had, quite a collection of books. I like to read histories, poetry, well, everything really. The prince smiled broadly at this. He responded, I do love histories. I'm intrigued by stories of the world. I wish I could go adventuring, but he cocked his head at his mother and father, seated in their grand chairs. I am not really afforded the freedom to do that right now. Cinderella nodded sympathetically, and they continued their turn around the room. Then, wistfully, Edward asked her to tell him just one more thing about herself. Anything. Pondering the question for a moment, she responded, Last week, it was my 18th birthday. 
brightening. Edward wished her a very happy birthday. At this, she felt butterflies in her stomach, and she looked down as if concentrating on her footwork. They both wished the night would never end. But end it must, and the time came when Cinderella knew she would have to break her own heart by carrying out a secret departure. She told Edward she was taking some air in the foyer, for the outdoor balcony was quite buried in snow. Her plan had been to slip into the cloakroom, but an unexpected obstacle appeared in the form of Agnes who seemed to be pursuing the company of a young gentleman. The awkward pair was standing right in front of the door. As the minutes ticked by, Cinderella lingered in the foyer, waiting. She waved to Edward, who stood across the ballroom occasionally glancing in her direction. Then she made a motion to fan her face, as if she were still too warm. The minutes dragged on. Finally, at least five minutes after the clock had told 11.30, Agnes released her hold on the hapless gentleman, returning to the ballroom. He hastily walked away, and Cinderella saw her chance. Slipping through the door, she located her cloak and pulled it around her, covering her head. Then she glided calmly through the foyer, making straight for the front door. Henry was waiting at the foot of the stairs with the sleigh, and she quickened her step. But right in the middle of the stairs, she slightly lost her footing and one of her delicate slippers fell off her foot, becoming lodged in the deepening snow. As the footmen cried after her that they would assist, she knew she did not have time to stop, nor could she afford to be noticed further. leaving the precious slipper behind. She made haste to the sleigh and climbed into the back seat, her cloak and her skirts ballooning behind her. Quick as a rabbit, the white horse took off, pulling the sleigh smoothly in its wake. As the sleigh darted away from the palace, Cinderella chanced a final glance into the darkness behind her. The footmen stood on the steps, holding her shoe, clearly in a commotion. For a third time, she had escaped the ball without offering an explanation. This time, however, just barely. During the speedy trip home, the snow finally stopped falling, and the moon emerged from the clouds. 
the eerily beautiful landscape seemed to lie purposely still, willing the sled to travel faster. Onward, onward, the hills and the snow-covered trees seemed to whisper, do not delay. In the end, Cinderella and Henry almost made it to the front door, but not quite. At the gates of the estate, the sleigh vanished, and Cinderella felt herself tumble into a snowdrift. Pulling herself up in a daze, she lifted her eyes just in time to see a white rabbit darting across the moonlit lawn. Henry sat nearby, shaking ice off his coat. Cinderella sat in the wet snow, oblivious to the cold. She looked at the fat pumpkin and then pulled herself to her feet. She left the heavy gourd there by the gate. It wasn't until she had trudged up the drive and climbed the front stairs that she realized something odd. Her cloak had vanished. Her clothes were once again rags. The tiara was gone. But one slipper still clung to her left foot. In amazement, she reached down and removed it, balancing the sparkling item in her palm. She didn't understand how it was still with her, but she would treasure it and hide it well so that nobody could take it away. Pushing her way into the dark house, she went straight to her room and pulled the covers of her bed over her head. In moments, she had succumbed to a dark and dreamless sleep. She awoke in the mid-morning the next day to a brilliant winter wonderland outside the window. The storm had passed and the sun reflected off every surface, filling even the gloomiest corners of the old house with natural light from outside. Cinderella dragged herself from her bed and went to her window seat. Peeking down at the front steps, she could see that Lydia and her stepsisters had somehow made it home in the wee hours of the morning. She was sure it must have been an arduous journey, a suspicion that was further supported by the silence in the hallway. They were all still abed and probably would be for hours. Turning around in her nook, Cinderella's eyes fell upon the dainty shoe that sat on her dressing table. What a wonder it was that the slipper was still here, she thought to herself. What lapse had occurred in the magic that it had been left behind? 
Perhaps it had something to do with the fact that she had lost the other one at the palace. She could make no sense of it, but she was happy to have it as a memento of what she was sure she'd remember as one of the best nights of her life. Wistfully, she tucked the shoe far underneath the dressing table. She smiled at Henry, who wagged his tail sympathetically at the door. She would have plenty of days to fill with memories of Edward in the future. But right now, she knew that the cook would be downstairs in need of her assistance. As before, her stepsisters rose and dressed in mid-afternoon. They then lounged about in the parlor, idly gossiping about the events of the ball. As before, they expressed annoyance with the mysterious lady, who had once again danced all night with Prince Edward. To think, Agnes complained, that we were there three times and never even got to meet him. Imogen agreed that it was ridiculous, and sniffed that it was just as well he was leaving the county, as his dances were becoming quite tiresome. Cinderella shook her head to herself, as she dusted the portraits in the corridor outside. She knew that her stepsisters were going to have to return to a reliance on country visits to other households in order to meet any young gentleman now. Lydia was sure to be in a terrible mood. The warmth of the sun began to melt the snowdrifts that day, and by the time the household awakened the next morning, it seemed like the world was coated in glass. Icicles hung from tree branches and from the eaves of the house. The snow was not as deep as it had been the day before, and the roads had become much more passable for horses and carriages. Nonetheless, accustomed as they were to isolation, the ladies were quite surprised to see a very richly appointed coach approaching the house in the late afternoon. Their curiosity turned to outright amazement when Prince Edward stepped out of the conveyance. He approached the house, followed by a haughty-looking footman, who appeared to be carrying a sparkling slipper. Without understanding how Prince Edward's arrival was even possible, or speculating that a mistake might have been made, Agnes and Imogen plunged towards the mirror, tidying their hair and pinching their cheeks. There was no time to change their clothes. He was climbing the steps at that very moment. They hastily positioned themselves at the top of the stairs, but on the way there, Imogen had the idea to make sure Cinderella was hidden away. 
knowing that the key to Cinderella's own room had been confiscated by Lydia. Agnes pushed the girl into Imogen's chamber and pulled the door shut, locking it from the outside. Cinderella thumped at the door. She didn't fully understand why she had been locked in, but she knew it had something to do with a surprise visitor. To be trapped in Imogen's messy chamber was an insult greater than she could quietly bear. Meanwhile, Lydia dragged the cook upstairs and bade her open the door, because she was the only person available in the house who appeared to be a servant. Once that charade was complete, the prince's footman announced that they had come to visit the young lady in the house, who was eighteen years of age. They were, in fact, visiting every house in the county where an eighteen-year-old debutante lived. They were in search of the young lady who happened to be the owner of this unusual shoe. Saying this, the footman held up the slipper with a flourish. Standing behind Lydia on the stairs, Imogen's eyes widened. She knew it was not her shoe, but as she was the only visible eighteen-year-old lady in the house, she was determined to seize the opportunity. As Lydia swept aside, inviting the royal visitors in. Imogen sashayed front and centre, and dropped a comically low curtsy. Meanwhile, Agnes pouted on the stairs. It was outrageous that Imogen should be the one to get a chance at the prince. The footman looked sideways at Edward, with an expression of skepticism. Likewise, Edward seemed crestfallen. This could not possibly be the ethereal creature he'd fallen in love with over the past few weeks. Sensing his hesitation, Imogen took action. Your Royal Highness, she began, her voice dripping with sweetness. I am so grateful to you for bringing my slipper back. Regretfully, the other was lost in the storm on the way home last night. However, I'm quite sure this one is mine. The prince peered at her again, cocking an eyebrow. Lydia's smile was frozen on her face. Seeing that Edward was about to withdraw, she pressed him further. Imogen is right about the sad loss of her other slipper. However, might she not try it on for you? I'm quite sure it will fit like a glove. At this, Agnes snorted from the stairway, earning herself a pointed look from her younger sister. Imogen's feet and hands were on the large side, and this slipper appeared to be quite petite. All three women, 
were aware that getting Imogen's foot into it would be quite a task. Before the prince could object, Lydia motioned impatiently to Cook that she should bring a chair. Rolling her eyes, the weary woman fetched one from another room, placing it squarely in the middle of the foyer. Imogen seated herself with great airs, behaving as she supposed a great lady might. Then, summoning a bit of a blush, she lifted up her foot and presented it to the royal servant. Giving the prince another wry glance, the man politely knelt down and attempted to slip the shoe onto Imogen's foot. He wriggled it, he knocked it, he adjusted its position. Imogen attempted to assist him, twisting her ankle this way and that, and furrowing her brow in concentration. Finally, by some miracle, she managed to jam her foot precariously inside. Although the shoe was bent and clearly did not suit her at all, Nonetheless, she saw a chance for victory. See, she said brightly, it's as if it was made for me. Then, covering her mouth in a false show of modesty, she added, And of course, it was. It's my slipper. Mine you can tell. Edward stood there, wordless. He looked like he might feel a bit unwell. But just then, there was an interruption that saved him from further unpleasantness. A little dog came running down the stairs whining. Dodging Agnes and her skirts, he leapt into the foyer, darted around Lydia, and sat in front of the prince with a shoe in his teeth. Edward's eyes widened with surprise, for it was the exact match that he was seeking and he was not the only one who appeared shocked. One by one, each woman in the hall widened her stare and brought a hand to her mouth. Replaying the ball in their minds, Lydia, Agnes, and Imogen realized the truth at the same moment. The mysterious girl had been none other than Cinderella. This all happened in a matter of seconds, and Imogen made a move to grab the slipper from the dog's mouth. My shoe, she said, as if delighted. But the faithful pup would not relinquish his treasure. He held fast to it, digging his little feet into the rug and pulling backwards. A comical tug of war ensued, and Agnes dissolved into a very inappropriate fit of laughter. 
Then, failing to grab her shoe after several moments, Imogen said, Henry, let the slipper go. And then, it was in her hands. But it was too late. Edward had heard the name that his beloved called her little dog. Looking at Lydia with a piercing stare, he asked where the other eighteen-year-old lady of the house was. One would think at this stage of the ruse that the stepmother would have acknowledged Cinderella's presence and tried to play the entire thing off as a misunderstanding. But Lydia was not ready to give up. She folded her arms and said there was no other lady in the house, just a serving girl. So Edward said, Please summon the serving girl. Spluttering with indignation, Lydia tried to make another excuse, but it was too late. Agnes had gone upstairs and unlocked the door to Imogen's room, and Cinderella had appeared on the stairs above, dressed in her rags. Now, one could say that Agnes did this to spite Imogen. Or, if a person had a sunny of you, they could say that she finally repented for treating Cinderella so poorly. Then again, isn't it wise to ally oneself with a person who is about to become a princess? Whatever reason Agnes had for helping Cinderella out of the locked chamber, the important point is, it happened. And in doing so, Agnes was the final, improbable bit of magic that made Cinderella's dreams come true. The moment that Edward spied Cinderella, a silent transformation overcame the players assembled in the foyer. The prince's face was beaming. Cinderella stood defiantly, finally ready to reveal herself. Lydia seemed to be composing herself in preparation to fawn all over her stepdaughter, offering explanations. Imogen looked angry whereas Agnes, standing on the landing with a key in her hand, appeared at peace. And the footman and cook, they had the appearance of two people who had seen justice done. They were obviously delighted. Henry broke the spell, bouncing up the stairs to greet his mistress. And at that moment, everyone was moving. The prince walked towards Cinderella as she descended the stairs, and all the ladies were a flutter. Then, Edward and Cinderella stood like an island in the midst of the confusion, their eyes locked together. 
neither of them wanted to be parted again. Cook made them comfortable in the parlor, and Lydia thought it best for the rest of them to withdraw, hoping the prince would overlook their terrible behavior. When Cinderella shared the plain circumstances of her poverty with Edward, he was surprisingly unconcerned. My parents certainly want me to choose a wife who will be a suitable partner in my public life, he said. But your circumstances are not your fault and we do not need money from your family. If you can tolerate my terrible taste in dog names, I would very much love it if you'd agree to be my wife. And, of course, she said yes, because she loved him. Having gained her acceptance, he furrowed his brow and appeared concerned. Afraid that something had occurred to him to prevent their marriage, Cinderella asked him what was wrong. Well, he said, you still have not told me your name. How incredible that I proposed to you, without even knowing it. Ah, she said, smiling. My stepsisters and my stepmother call me Cinderella, but I would much prefer that you call me by the name my mother and father gave me, which is Arabella. Edward smiled, for he finally knew the name of the woman who had captured his heart. And so it was that later that week, Arabella gathered Henry and her few possessions and was whisked away to the palace where an army of servants helped her prepare for her nuptials. After all, there was so very much to do, and it was far too much to put on Cook. Before she departed, Arabella returned one last time to her mother's garden where she knelt down and uncovered her mother's box of jewels. Opening it carefully, she saw that they were all still there, as if they'd never been disturbed. The topaz, the sapphire, and the tiara lay nestled safely next to her mother's wedding ring. This last item she held up to the light, turning it every which way. She decided she would wear it when she was married. A few weeks after she moved into the palace, Edward appeared in the elegant drawing room while she was discussing some aspect of her wedding dress with the seamstresses. He appeared very excited and told her that he had a surprise for her. Stepping aside, he revealed Malcolm. Neither father nor daughter 
could contain their joy, and everyone in the room was quite moved by their happy reunion. Malcolm looked like he had aged many years during his travels, and he explained that his expedition had gone off course, and then become stranded in an unfamiliar place. There had been no way to send a letter, and they had lost the ship that would have brought them home. Edward had hired men to track her father's last known whereabouts. Communicating with local people and following clues, these emissaries of the prince had beaten a path to where Malcolm and his men were stranded. Edward had brought her father home to her, which was the greatest gift he could have possibly given on the occasion of their wedding. She tearfully apologized to Malcolm that she had not been able to keep the estate in order, but he told her that she had done magnificently and he expressed regret that Lydia had allowed such a burden to fall on her shoulders. If anyone bore fault, it was Lydia and her daughters. And the question of what would happen to them was the next order of business. Malcolm's journey had not resulted in great wealth, and he was facing lean times on his estate. Lydia was greatly displeased at this, but she was his wife, and they would manage. As for Agnes and Imogen, Arabella decided that they should have a chance to redeem themselves. Feeling rather magnanimous, she offered them both places at the palace, although she thought it best if they were not in her personal entourage. After all, water under the bridge is easier said than done. Both girls saw the opportunity as a chance to pursue a new life, and as Arabella had hoped, a kinder one. So it was that Cinderella laid her past resentments to rest. Of course, No fairy tale could be complete without a glimpse of its happy ending, and you can rest assured that Arabella and her prince had that in spades. Their glittering wedding was the event of the decade the most delightful people were invited, and the happy pair set off afterwards on a trip around the kingdom, where Arabella enchanted the people of one county after another. Edward also became quite close with Malcolm, who was rich in worldly experience, if not in funds. They spent many hours discussing the wonders of the world together, and respected each other greatly. This made Arabella very happy.
you'll want to know if Arabella's fairy godmother ever appeared again. And of course, the answer is yes. She may have been more of a breath on the wind, or an unexpected strain of music in an empty room. But Arabella had the sense that she was always there, somehow. Even when the newly minted princess had to travel far from her mother's garden, the spirit of magic somehow came along. With it, she never felt alone, and she knew that her mother, or godmother's love, was always protecting her and helping her remember to be beautiful both inside and out. Rest assured, Cinderella and her prince, most certainly, without a doubt, lived happily ever after.